Hi, it's Richard Dwyer of richarddwyer.com and of keepingitfree.blogspot.com. Today is June the 29th, 2018. Let's talk about the case of Darley Routier. Now, this is the focal point of an excellent true crime series on television right now that I'm going to give my highest rating. It's called The Last Defense. And on this show, you have defense experts, including some who were retained by the attorney for the convicted, right? As well as appellate attorneys reviewing the evidence that led to the conviction of the accused, in this case, Darley Routier, who was convicted of killing her two sons, five-year-old Damien and six-year-old Devin, right, in the living room of her house. Now, the show, which is executive produced by Viola Davis, a personal favorite of mine, right, clearly has a mission. They want to have the public take a second look at Ms. Routier's case as she sits right now on death row. Now, let me say this just in terms of where you know I'm coming from, right? I'm an attorney in Northern California. I used to be a civil litigator. Now, I also do divorce work. Right? I've had cases where I've represented battered women. I've gone to trial and have won um, where we've sought things like a permanent restraining order. Let me also say, too, that right now I'm involved in a case where we have raised the issue of child endangerment. Minors Council has been appointed. Right? We're trying to stand up for the kids. My client right now has primary physical custody. With regard to the death penalty, let me just add, too, that I'm against the death penalty. I don't believe the state should have that power, especially when it's been proven that some of the people on death row are innocent. Right? At the beginning of For the Defense, they actually point out the numbers, how every year some people on death row get exonerated. In an imperfect system, I don't like irreversible remedies. So let me say, as I dive into this Darley Routier case, understand that I don't believe I'm predisposed to find her guilty, right? Let me point out too that here online, I have made a series of true crime videos. And in some of them, I actually reached the conclusion that the person should not have been convicted, right? Don't assume that in every video, I reached a conclusion that the police have done a great job, the prosecution is king, and this accused person has to pay for the crime even when the evidence is dodgy. But let me say this, with regard to this case, right? Is Ms. Routier really guilty? In my opinion, I believe the answer is yes. Let's talk about it. First, I'm going to talk about some problems with the case, then I'm going to give you my theory of the case. It's one I believe the prosecution already has considered and made a decision not to actively pursue it at trial because it's too controversial. Right? Now, let's talk about the mistakes Darley makes that, in my opinion, they gloss over in the last line of defense, right? Or in the last defense television series. Now, understand, Darley 
Well, first, let me back up a second. Did you know that the Routiers actually had a dog who barked at strangers? Who did not bark that night until the cops came to the house. Then the dog was aggressive with the police. The dog went after one cop. Another cop who knew the dog was able to subdue the dog. In other words, the dog was really protective of the family. But yet while this intruder was in the house, understand that the dog did not bark. Darlie Rotier contends that while the intruder was killing her two sons, she was fast asleep. Her husband upstairs with their infant child is fast asleep while the intruder is killing their two sons in the living room just feet away from where Darley lay on the couch. Right, now it is noteworthy that they have a dog but the dog doesn't bark until the cops get there. That's according by the way to the defense version. Right, Darley doesn't say she hears the dog barking. Well, let's get into mistakes she makes <clears throat> in her version of events, in my opinion. She claims an intruder after stabbing her very young sons. Again, five-year-old Damon and six-year-old Devin. And after slicing her neck with a large kitchen knife from the house, Right? Darlie Rotier claims that this intruder then runs through the kitchen. <clears throat> he knocks over a glass. Darlie has just woken up with a wound across her neck. Right? She's been sliced in the throat. But, even though this intruder has a knife, even though she wakes up and she's been sliced in the neck. She claims that she then chases after him. This is with her kids feet away from her stabbed. This is with blood. Right? From the kids' stab wounds. Darlie Rotier doesn't go to the kids, she chases after the intruder, running through the kitchen over the broken glass, right? They actually struggle a little bit, then he takes off through the kitchen, she follows him. Now, in my opinion, this part of her story is a huge problem for her. Right? It's glossed over in the television series. <clears throat> her bloody footprints, right? Blood's on her feet because her kids have just been stabbed multiple times in the chest and are bleeding in the living room. And Darley, getting off the sofa, puts her feet in the blood. Her bloody footprints with blood from her kids are under the glass that's on the floor in the kitchen, right? It doesn't match her chronology of events. If the glass breaks first, then her blood should be on the glass, not under the glass. Now the defense has an explanation for this, right? The explanation boils down to the argument that the crime scene was contaminated. 
that when the police show up at the crime scene, their number one concern, as it should be, is for the health and safety of the people at the crime scene. So the police show up, the paramedics show up, and they're tending to the kids. They're going through the kitchen, not thinking initially about evidence collection, but thinking about making sure that this intruder isn't still in the house, doesn't pose a present and continuing danger to the people in the house. They're trying to make sure everyone's safe. So the defense wants you to believe that the police, the first responders, walked through that kitchen, may have kicked pieces of glass, may have distorted the evidence so that it just looks like Darley's blood is underneath the glass, right? That's the argument they make in the series. They sound convincing. But let's use common sense here. Darley Rotier, according to her version of events, has just woken up from sleeping. She's not wearing shoes. She runs through a kitchen that has glass on the floor. Why aren't her feet cut from the glass? If she's in such a high adrenaline situation, right? According to her, the intruder tried to mount her on the sofa. She fights with the guy. The guy runs off. She runs after him. If it's that kind of high adrenaline situation and she's running over glass in the kitchen chasing this intruder, wouldn't her feet have gashes? Why don't they? Does the defense theory of the scene being contaminated explain the absence of wounds on Darley Rotier's feet? Let me also say this too. I'm going to raise some other questions here. I don't want this to be a one-way presentation. <clears throat> Rather, I want this to be a conversation between not just you and me, but also the people writing comments in the comment section. I want you to comment on this case among yourselves. What we're trying to do is to spur discussion here on the case, right? It's a death penalty case. Someone's on death row. Two young kids lost their lives, right? So you don't have to agree with me Rather, what I want is a discussion of the facts in the comment section. If you have any information about Darley Rotier's feet, the degree to which they were cut or why they weren't cut, go beyond this video and I hope you leave those facts in the comment section to this video. Right? Let's just say that I watched the show, I heard the theory about crime scene contamination, which I don't buy. Right, And I thought, even if the crime scene's contaminated, Darlie Rotier should have cut up feet, shouldn't she? She doesn't. Let's also talk about something else. Darley is wearing a nightgown, right? A nightgown. Now let's be clear on the wounds that the kids suffered. Someone stood over them with a knife. I'll use my pen here. And literally stabbed them in the chest, right? The two kids have their lungs destroyed. They can't breathe. 
the husband testified that when he tried to resuscitate, one of the boys' blood blew back on him out of the boy's chest. The boy had been cut up that much. Again, by someone standing over them or above them, stabbing them in the chest. Now let's pretend I'm Darley Rotier. Let's pretend this is my nightgown, right? Understand that both boys' blood was found on the back of her nightgown. Understand the blood on the back is consistent with cast off splatter from someone reaching back with a knife and blood casting off and hitting the back of her nightgown. Right? Understand, the evidence wouldn't be relevant if their blood's on the back of her nightgown, smeared in a way where it's inconsistent with cast off splatter. That's not the case, folks. These are small dots of the kid's blood on the back of her nightgown. The back. That's consistent with cast off splatter. Now, on the show, they point out that the prosecution expert was actually able to duplicate the cast off splatter in his own investigation. And they show you a film of this expert reaching back, wearing a white top, right? He's reaching back like this, mimicking the stabbing motion. And of course, he has the same type of spots on the back of the shirt he's wearing. Now, the defense wants you to believe that there wasn't enough centrifugal force in reaching a hand back to have that splatter hit the back of Darley's nightgown. Now, let me just say this politely. If the prosecution expert on film, on camera, was able to duplicate what happened, then doesn't that rule out the defense argument about it not being possible? Folks, not only is it possible, it's been done by an expert. Let me go one step further. On the TV show, they show you a prosecutor, excuse me, a defense person pulling the knife back to here, right? To show that the blood couldn't have hit the back of Darley's shirt, right? In a high adrenaline situation where a mother has made a decision to kill her kids, right? Why is it unbelievable to believe that Darley Rotier has a little bit of wasted motion and might be reeling back a bit as she stabs the knife out of the adrenaline created by the moment? I find the kid's blood on the back of her nightgown to be very damning evidence, especially when the splatter is consistent with cast off. Right? I believe this is the kind of thing that someone doing a crime wouldn't think of. Darley Rotier doesn't think of it. The fact that the same knife is used to kill both kids and the blood of both kids is on the back of her nightgown 
to me is very damning. Obviously, she leans over the kids. There's blood on the front. But it's the blood on the back that I don't think this television show properly addresses. When they have the defense guy going like this, look, maybe there's no wasted moment, uh, motion. But that doesn't rule out the fact that someone killing for the first time very emotional killing, killing a family member, might not reel back like this, might not have all of their juices flowing, might not be so caught up in the murder, the moment, that they would reach back and have blood hit the back of their nightgown. Especially given, too, by the way, that the wounds on the kids are deep. Right? Very deep wounds. Someone had to stick the knife in with such force that you're breaking through bone and muscle. Let me also make a point here on the kitchen. Now, Darley claims she runs through the kitchen. You know when you run, People can then look at the spacing of your footprints to figure out your gait, your stride, right? A person running through a field is going to leave footprints wider apart than a person who walks through a field. Now, here again, this is the kind of thing that someone might overlook when they're doing a crime. But the footprints in the kitchen, the spacing, don't show a person running through the kitchen. Rather, they show a person almost standing still. Her story of running through the kitchen is not supported by the spacing of the footprints in the kitchen. Right? So, let me just say this, and there are many other facts. I've overlooked many of the facts. Right? I'm not going to focus on what the defense calls character assassination of Darley Rotier. Right? But just understand, even the defense concedes that Darley Rotier was suffering from postpartum depression. Even the defense concedes that Darley Rotier wrote some suicidal things in her diary. Right? So let's talk about a theory of the case that actually deals with one of the biggest pieces of evidence in the case. There's a bloody sock. It has the blood of both of the kids. Right? It has Darley's DNA on it. There's a bloody sock found outside of the house, 75 yards away. The defense says, hey, given that the cops respond to the 911 call that night within three minutes, three minutes, and given that Darley Rotier has a slash across her neck, there simply is no way that she could have called the cops gone out of the house, dropped this sock 75 yards away from the house, come back into the house, slashed her neck, slashed the screens on the window, and then had the police arrive all within that short three-minute time period. Now, what's an interesting argument at first? Let's talk about my theory of what actually happened that night. You can judge it. You can dispute it. 
Now understand there are two adults in the house. Two. Darren upstairs and Darley in the living room with her two young boys, the two victims in this case. According to Darley's version of events, neither adult nor apparently the dog heard anything whatsoever as this intruder enters the house and then stabs the two boys to death. Right? They didn't hear anything. For you to buy into Darley's version of events, this intruder could have then left. Darley would have woken up hours later and would have just seen her boys dead, right? That's very important. Because I believe that night what really happened was that Darley had far more time than any of us want to believe. In other words, this case is actually more depraved and more macabre than any of us want to fathom. Understand, since no one hears anything, what if Darley Rotier kills her kids? Nobody's heard anything. Would she then have time to grab a sock, make sure it has the blood of both kids, and then walk out the house 75 yards, drop the sock off, come back to the house, cut the screen door, and then stand over the kitchen sink and cut her neck. Now the prosecution didn't want to raise this theory of Darley having not three minutes, but let's say more like 12 minutes or 15 minutes to stage this scene. But I believe that's what she had, folks, because in the kitchen, the police show up and the kitchen sink looks a bit too clean. So they then spray luminol. They spray some substance on the sink to detect the presence of blood. And what they find is that there was a lot of blood, a lot of blood, around the kitchen sink that got cleaned up. Right? Who was there to clean up the crime scene that night? It's even worse than that. They find that someone by the couch where Darley was sleeping actually cleaned up part of the couch. There's a palm print from one of the kids that someone tried to wipe away by the sofa. Understand too, when the cops arrive, they see the murder weapon, the knife that Darley claims the intruder drops and she picks up, right? And right by the knife is Darley's jewelry and Darley's purse. Understand, one of the problems with this case is what the motive is for the intruder. If it's a robbery and he enters the house 
and there's Darley's jewelry. There are easy valuables to take and everyone's asleep. Why would the intruder then decide to pivot and kill two kids? Even after he kills the kids, If mom's still asleep, why would the intruder then try to, in Darley's words, mount her? Right? If the intruder's motive is robbery, he doesn't have to kill anyone. Understand, neither Darren nor Darley even heard the kids getting killed. The guy could have come in grabbed the jewelry, that's easy to pawn, gotten out of the house. Let's go one step further. The bedroom's upstairs. Darley's with the kids in the living room. Let's pretend we're the burglar. What percentage of burglars would enter a house and then see three members of the family, three, in the living room, and then decide to stick around. Isn't that a bit of a reach? Also consider this possibility, because Darley Rotier apparently underwent a rape kit at the hospital, right? Google Garley's statements here online. And you're gonna see that Darley is intimating that the guy tried to sexually assault her, right? If a rapist comes into the house and sees a mother with two small kids in the living room and no one knows the rapist is there. Again, the intruder gets in, awakens no one. Even the dog is not barking. Is it plausible that that intruder would then decide to kill the kids So he could be alone with the woman who is married with her husband upstairs, right? We're assuming that the rapist has actually stalked Darley Rotier, has picked her house for a reason, because he knows she lives there. A stalker would also realize that this is high risk, right? She's married, husband in the house. We have no evidence that the stalker has any kind of gun or ever takes out a gun. Worse yet, we have no evidence that the stalker has any kind of weapon because all of the weapons used are from the house. Right, so this stalker comes in knowing that Darley's a married woman, knowing that Darley has a husband and a dog and kids, then sees her in the living room with two kids. We're supposed to believe that this rapist, if the intruder's a rapist and not a burglar who decides not to take any jewels, Right? We're to believe that this rapist would then quietly kill the kids and then try to mount Darley on the sofa. Right? I have a problem with her story, folks. It just doesn't sound believable to me. Worse yet, the idea that someone tried to clean up around 
the kitchen sink area. Right? Something that is inconsistent with Darley's story. Right? This intruder is supposed to get in, kill the kids, try to attack her. She's supposed to chase him. He's supposed to run out. Right? He's not supposed to linger in the kitchen and then to start actually trying to clean up things. Let me also point out too that the scene as you can imagine is very bloody. It's very bloody. So bloody that Darley's leaving bloody footprints in the kitchen. That's how bloody it is, folks. Right? Understand, too, this intruder is supposed to have slashed Darley's neck, then tried to mount Darley. When you look at Darley's nightgown, there's blood all around the front of the nightgown. Now, whether this intruder is wearing gloves or not, Right? Wouldn't you expect someone leaving a bloody crime scene to leave a trail of blood someplace? Right? If I'm leaving the crime scene and I go through the garage and I go out a window, in the same way that Darley Rotier is leaving bloody footprints, wouldn't you expect me, the intruder, even if I'm wearing sneakers, even if I'm wearing gloves, even if I'm not leaving fingerprints anywhere, wouldn't you expect me to leave some blood droplings someplace? Right? Think of the O.J. Simpson crime. He leaves the scene of the murder, right? We're going with the civil uh, guilty finding here, right? He leaves the liable finding here. He leaves the scene of the murder, and then there's a smidge of blood on the door to his Bronco. Inside the Bronco, there's other blood, right? On the console and stuff like that. Now here, the defense wants you to believe that this intruder leaves a very bloody scene where two kids have been stabbed to death with a knife from the house, where mom is leaving bloody footprints where she goes. And yet this intruder leaves no bloody trail whatsoever. Right? Even though the intruder has absolutely no time to clean up at all. The intruder is even supposed to have dropped a bloody knife after running through the kitchen. In other words, he's running with the bloody knife. You would imagine this bloody knife, blood's flowing all over the place, right? He's just sliced Darley, according to her version of events. Moments earlier, he has this knife. He's running away. Now, I don't buy the defense contention that the knife magically dries itself. Right? That there's a lot of wind and movement and this knife dries itself. Right? This intruder has a knife. He's running away. He drops the knife. Even after dropping the knife. How does the intruder avoid leaving bloody footprints how does the intruder avoid leaving blood any place let's say you're wearing gloves and your gloves get in blood as i'm getting out of the house as i'm grabbing the frame to move out of the house how come there's no handprint anywhere left by the intruder how come there's really nothing left by the intruder? Now, I understand appeals are ongoing. 
I understand there's an argument people want to make that there's a bloody fingerprint, right? It's contested, but the defense believes there's a bloody fingerprint that's unidentified someplace. Am I supposed to believe that this intruder didn't wear gloves? Had his hands exposed and only left a debatable fingerprint someplace? So let's just say the lack of a forensic trail for the intruder's exit troubles me. So let's sum up what I believe happened that night. I believe Darley Rotier stabs the kids to death. Then I believe she cleans up the crime scene a little bit. She thinks things through. Right? I believe she does go outside. I believe she drops the sock 75 yards away from the house. Then she comes back inside, stands by the kitchen sink, and tries to cut herself just enough, just enough to make it look like she's a victim. Understand, the cut isn't deep enough to prevent her one week later from going to her kid's grave site, right? The, the Silly String video. She's there, right? Her neck's just been cut. Folks, the cut is superficial. Yes, apparently the cut comes two millimeters away from hitting a major artery. Okay, fair enough, right? But the cut's not deep like the kids cuts, right? The cut is, Darlie's not a doctor. She may not have known how close she came to actually cutting her own artery. But when you look at the cut, understand it's the kind of cut they were able to fix within the week, right? It's more superficial. It looks worse than it is. Why would an intruder who has just stabbed two kids to death, who then is trying to mount Darley, who then gets blowback from Darley, who still has the butcher knife in his hand, according to Darley, because he doesn't drop that until he's right past the kitchen. Why wouldn't he plunge the knife into Darley just like he plunged the knife into the kids? So, understand, Darley, in her haste at night, makes mistakes. The vacuum cleaner is on top of the blood. She knocks over the vacuum cleaner to make it look like there's a struggle. The glass clearly doesn't hit the floor until after her bloody footprints are on the floor. Right, the scene is staged. The knife used to cut the screen is from her kitchen block. The defense wants you to believe that that knife may have been contaminated by one of the techs dusting for fingerprints, right? They dust the window and then in what would only be clear malpractice, they then use the same duster. If you believe the defense, to dust the knife block, right? That doesn't make sense to me. The absence of outside weapons doesn't make sense to me. If murdering these kids is such a priority for the intruder, as opposed to just grabbing the jewelry that's right here, that, ir that ironically is found right by the murder weapon, Right? If murdering the kids is that big a priority for the intruder, why didn't the intruder bring their own weapon to the murder scene? 
right? So I believe Darley has a window here. It's about 10 minutes, right? She's depressed. These kids are taking up too much of her time, right? She kills the kids. She then has thought it all through. She's going to drop off the sock outside. She's going to come back to the house. She's going to cut herself by the kitchen sink after she cleans up part of the murder scene. Why? Because she wouldn't be able to explain the kid's handprint, the bloody handprint, in the living room that she tries to clean up. By the way, Darley is claiming that she has amnesia for part of the attack, right? She's claiming she doesn't fully remember what happened. She's claiming she never saw what happened to the kids. That when she's awakened by this intruder, the kids have already been stabbed. Now understand, her husband told authorities that Darley was a light sleeper. A light sleeper. But yet that night she's supposed to be out cold as her kids are getting killed. So here's where I believe it really takes a turn for the worse. The cops arrive. One of her kids is still alive. The cop says to Darley, you want to apply pressure to that wound. Right? Darley doesn't. The defense wants you to believe that Darley was looking about the kids before the cops got there and that Darley had put towels by the kids before the cop got there. But understand, one kid's still alive. Why wouldn't Darley apply pressure to the wound as long as the kid is still breathing? Wouldn't a parent at that point do whatever they could to keep their child alive? No, what I believe happened was that Darley thought the kids were dead. She makes the call. The cops arrive. Suddenly, one kid starts hacking a bit. Suddenly, that's when Darley realizes that this kid is alive. Darley, at that point, may have thought to herself, wow, the kid's not going to support my story. The kid, who was probably fast asleep when he got stabbed, might tell the cops that the only person he saw in the house was me. Given the pattern, the blood pattern in the kitchen that shows someone walking through the kitchen, if the kid were conscious, the kid might blow holes through Darley's version of events that would have Darley running through the kitchen after someone. So I believe Darley Rotier as the police officer tells her, you want to apply pressure to this kid's wounds, Darley Rotier makes a decision. She can't have this kid live, right? She doesn't apply pressure to the wounds. She doesn't do anything. The officer so dumbfounded he took the stand at her trial and told the jury he was puzzled by her behavior. Right? So to sum up, you know, I, uh, I'm against the death penalty myself. I completely have a deep appreciation for people who want to re-examine these cases and who want to ask the tough questions of whether or not the convicted actually did the crime. In this case, in this case, where the kids are killed and the dog doesn't bark. 
right? No one hears the kids being killed. The first Darren upstairs hears of the murders is Darley yelling for him, right? The, the timing of everything keys off Darley Rotier's version of events, right? I think this is the wrong case to claim that the convicted didn't do the crime. There are too many holes in her story, right? The idea that contamination somehow caused Darley's blood to be under the glass in the kitchen is ridiculous, right? The fact that the luminol by the kitchen sink shows a lot of blood wiped up. I'm sure the defense at trial had the prosecution relied on that portion of the evidence. I'm sure the defense at trial would have said, hey, we don't know when the blood was left there. Right? That could have been from blood five months ago. Right? Just understand it's consistent. Given that the murder weapons found right by there. Right? It's consistent with someone standing over the kitchen sink, especially since the blood pattern on the kitchen floor shows that someone's standing still. Right? It's consistent with someone standing over the kitchen sink, cutting themselves in a way where they look like they're the victim of a violent intruder who tried to kill them. Let me point out, too, of course. There isn't enough blood by the sofa where Darley claims she was stabbed in the neck. Compare and contrast the blood on Darley's nightgown with the lack of blood on the sofa. I don't believe her version makes sense. I think she did this crime. I think it took her at least 10 minutes to do so. I think she did the crime. She then went about planning a sock outside the house, right? This, this case is a lot like the Jeffrey McDonald case, which I'll talk about in another video, where Darley's on diet pills, right? At the time of the murder, right? There's evidence outside the house. Curiously enough, there's an absence of evidence of an intruder, right? And the scene is staged somewhat, but it's staged in the way that someone who thinks they're smarter than everyone else would stage a scene, not realizing that certain things play into the interpretation of the evidence, like the spacing of the footprints in the kitchen, like the fact that the knocked over vacuum cleaner is on top of the blood, right? The blood's not on the vacuum cleaner. There's no struggle that takes place where the vacuum cleaner is knocked over and blood goes on the vacuum cleaner, right? The cut screens, I don't think Darley expected a knife from her kitchen block to come back positive for being used to cut the screen, right? The lack of any trail from the intruder leaving the place, right? This intruder, bloody scene, stabs kids in the chest with a knife from the house, right? Then he's leaving, bloody scene, but yet somehow is able to leave without leaving any blood on the way out. I just don't think that's credible. I think she did this crime. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.